Okay, here's part two of the supplementary lecture uh, for Urban Sociology, West Virginia State, West Virginia State University. Uh, for chapter seven, um, there's a lot of different ways we could divide uh, social class. Now, when we meet in class, we're gonna we're gonna apply this class system more specifically to cities since we are in an urban sociology class, but I want to talk just generally about the class system in our country. And you'll be able to stop and pause this since it's on, since it's on YouTube, uh, and you can kind of take notes kind of that way. But I'm going to break it down the following way. We're going to talk about the upper class, and within the upper class you have the upper upper class and the lower upper class. You have the middle class, and then you have the upper and the average middle class. We have the working class, which is also known as the lower middle class, but I'm going to refer to it as the working class. And last, you kind of see it there, and there's a little bit of a glare, we have what's called the lower class. So that's kind of how we'll start. And I'm going to start with a definition of social class that you'll want to jot down. Social class, by definition, refers to a large group of people who rank closely to one another in terms of wealth, power, and prestige. Um, some have mentioned, we, we talked about Lynn Loftland in class, um, some like her have mentioned that you can sometimes just look at people and get a, a good idea of where they might fit, not only within the city um, or within the urban context, but also within the class system. Uh, you, you, you can look and see what people are driving in terms of their automobiles, the kind of homes they live in, the neighborhoods they live in, the kind of clothes that they wear, and get an idea kind of, of where they might fit in the social class system. Although this can be deceiving uh, at times. Social class, again, we're talking about people who are ranked pretty closely to one another in terms of wealth, power, and prestige. And we'll start with the upper class. Now, just generally speaking, and I hope you guys can see this. I hope that will come through okay. Um, we're looking at the top 5% of the population in this country. They earn at least $200,000 per year, and sometimes way more than that. That $200,000 a year number is really a floor number. Their income largely is from inherited wealth, uh, stocks and bonds, real estate, and other investments. And we're talking historically about a, a Caucasian or a white population. Uh, the richest 400 people in the United States are worth somewhere between $950 million dollars and 50 billion with a B dollars. So this gives you an idea of what we're talking about in the upper class. Um, the first division, the upper upper class, this is the very top of the upper class. We're talking about the blue bloods. Uh, people with last names like Rockefeller or DuPont. Um, this is inherited money. These people generally don't have to work. They can, but they don't have to work. Uh, enormous wealth, which is primarily inherited, less than 1% of the population would fall within the upper, upper class. A lot of them live in exclusive neighborhoods, uh, generally in urban areas or close to urban areas. Uh, they complete formal education at very high prestige colleges, and they're studying liberal arts. Uh, generally, they're not studying vocational skills. So... If you want a couple of examples of people who would fall within the upper upper class, um, perhaps Bill Gates would be there. He's worth at one time. Now these slides are just a few years old, so they might be a little bit outdated, but you're going to get the idea. Uh, at least as of a couple of years ago, Bill Gates was worth sixty billion dollars. Um, Jim Walton, you've heard of Walmart probably, uh, was worth was worth uh, approximately twenty billion dollars a few years ago. Uh, those numbers have probably gone up. I think his sons now own, or his children rather, uh, I think he has three or four kids, now uh, own Walmart, and they're worth a lot as well. Uh, the lower upper class. This is the bottom shelf of the upper class. It's still a good place to be. Uh, most upper class people in the U.S. actually fall here. Now we're talking about the working rich. We're not talking about people who were born into wealth and have enjoyed it and known nothing different. Um, these are people who probably started somewhere in the middle class or maybe even the lower class and they have worked their way into this class. Uh, so they obtain their money by earning it rather than inheriting it. 
uh, J.K. Rowling, for example, uh, the author of the Harry Potter books. Um, a lot of most professional athletes and actors that you can think of um, would fall within the lower upper class. And they make up approximately 4% of the U.S. population. Oprah Winfrey is a good example. Uh, she started off in, in Chicago, Illinois, uh, from the lower class structure. And through her television program, through investing, uh, etc., has amassed a fortune. And is one of the richest people in the entire United States. But she worked for that. She wasn't born into it. Uh, any, a lot of professional athletes, again, like Albert Pujols, he doesn't play for the Cardinals anymore, but um, at any rate, he was awarded the richest contract in baseball about three years ago. Um, so he worked his way into that, into the social class system. He wasn't born rich. Now we get into the middle class. This is where most of us will fall. Approximately 40 to 45 percent of the U.S. population will fall within the middle class. A tremendous influence on our culture. If you can think of your very favorite situation, uh, comedy on TV, uh, regardless of your age, um, I will bet you money that it's probably depicting a family or a situation that's in the middle class. Uh, famous sitcoms like Roseanne from the 1980s, um, Big Bang Theory, uh, which is popular right now. Um, Middle class, friends from the uh, from the nineties and into two thousand, uh, Seinfeld, uh, Will and Grace. I'm trying to think of some more very popular sitcoms. Most of those are set within the middle class because most people in this country fall within the middle class. So it makes sense. TVs and movie, uh, excuse me, TV shows and movies are also geared uh, to middle class populations. Far more racial and ethnic diversity here than in the upper class. Um, Within the upper class, again, it's still, it's still for the most part Caucasian, if you will. Now, that's not to say that ethnic minorities have not climbed into the upper class, but that, that is still the exception and not the rule. Um, in the upper middle class, we'll go ahead and start dividing this out. The upper middle class family income ranges from $113,000 a year in income to $200,000 a year in family income. They live in comfortable homes in kind of expensive areas. They may own several automobiles, uh, two or three. Uh, Two-thirds will graduate from college. What you're going to find, one of the trends you're going to notice very quickly, is that the higher up in the social class system you are, the more educational, uh, uh, the higher the educational attainment and vice versa. Okay, When you climb down into the lower rungs of the social class ladder, educational attainment is, um, is a lot lower or less. Uh, Postgraduate degrees are very common in the upper middle class, and so not just bachelor's degrees, but master's degrees and PhDs, EDDs. Uh, very high prestige occupations are common, uh, white collar jobs, doctors, lawyers, etc. They influence local political affairs. A lot of people that you see on local boards uh, or in decision making positions in politics, uh, they can. Um, you know, they can they can influence they can influence local political affairs to a large extent. Now, not really national or international affairs. That would be that would be more reserved for people in the upper class. So, again, the higher up you are on the ladder, the more power that you can, the more power that you you have. So there you go. Now, now we're squarely in the middle of the class structure, the average middle class. Family income generally falls between $49,000 and $113,000 per year. Uh, less prestigious white-collar jobs like middle management, teachers, etc. would fall within the average middle class. And you have some higher status blue-collar positions that could land you in the middle class as well. I know a lot of coal miners who have been working for 20, 30 years and they're making really good money. Uh, so there are some exceptions to that, uh, to that as well. They can build up a small amount of wealth over the course of a lifetime. They may end up owning their own home. They may command a retirement account. Most will graduate from high school, and 50% or half will complete a college degree at a less expensive state school. So, again, teachers, there you go, are a good example of people who would probably fall squarely in the middle of the class structure. Now we move down another step into what's called the working class. Approximately one-third of the U.S. population falls here. 
this has also been called the lower middle class. So 33% of the population, largely blue collar jobs that require a lot of supervision. So in other words, there's not a lot of creativity or independence. People who have jobs here within the working class generally are being told what to do and how to do it. Um, very structured, which doesn't bring a lot of satisfaction for those working these positions. Uh, annual family income ranges from 28000 to about $49,000 a year. So you can imagine, let's just take a middle number, let's just say $35,000 a year. That might sound like a pretty good amount you know, if you're living by yourself and you're first starting off. But if you're if you looking if you're looking at a family of three or four, and you're making thirty five thousand dollars a year after tax, that's it's going to be very difficult to uh, to make that work. People in the working class have very little, if any, wealth because uh, it's hard to it's hard to accumulate wealth if you're not making very much money. People in the working class start to become way more vulnerable to problems than people in the middle and the upper classes. Uh, they become more vulnerable to financial problems caused by unemployment or illness. Uh, jobs in the working class are less stable. They don't pay as much. Often, these jobs provide few, if any, benefits or medical insurance or pension plans. So that's a really big deal. Um, if you, you know, I can think of a situation where you know, my, my daughter was injured. She had to have medical care. Um, if I had to pay for all that, with, had I, if I didn't have any medical insurance and I had to pay for every bit of that, I would have been in a lot of trouble because it was it would have cost me thousands of dollars. Um, but I had that. I had that medical insurance that covered her, so I was good. If you don't have that and you have to come up with money and you're not making $30,000 a year uh, and you have to pay $5,000 in hospital uh, bills, it's going to be very difficult. It just adds to the problem or the problems that you see in this class. Uh, illness. If you're sick, you miss work, you may lose your job. Um, for, you know, just some real problems there. Two-thirds of people in the working class own their own homes, usually in low-cost neighborhoods. Only one-third will attend college. That's not even talking about graduating from college, but will attend. So people are very quick to look at people in the working class and the poorer class, and they say, well, they're just not very smart, or they're just not very motivated. That's why they don't go to college. Well, it might be more appropriate to look at these numbers and realize that we're talking about um, access. We're talking about you know opportunity. A lot of people in the working classes, uh, in the working class, may want to go to college and may be able to, but they can't afford it. So that makes a big difference. And then we have the very bottom of the social class system, the lower class. Twenty percent or one fifth of the U.S. population will fall here. Life is even more insecure and more difficult in the lower class than it is in the working class. In 2008, 40 million people uh, were defined as being poor. Uh, this has also been referred to as the working poor class. We're going to call it the lower class. Very low prestige jobs providing little satisfaction and low pay. We're talking about minimum wage jobs. Um, only half will graduate from high school. So we're, you know, we're taking another big chunk out of educational attainment here. So people look at people... Uh, excuse me, people look at those in the lower class and we just, sometimes we assume, well, they're just not, again, they're not motivated, they're not intelligent, they can't even graduate from high school, they're losers, blah, 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 whatever. Um, well, if you're in the lower class and you're poor, you're going to be dealing with problems like basic security problems like, you know, food, you know, where am I going to get my next meal? Or maybe I don't have a place to stay tonight. Or you know drugs and crime and all these other things that go with being in the lower class. Those are going to take. Uh, those are going to be more important than getting a grade, a good grade on a math test in high school. So, all this stuff is going to get in the way of academic success. The people in the middle class and the upper classes don't have to deal with as much, or at all. Only a fourth will attend college, or 25 uh, percent. And that's again not even talking about graduation from college. Um, I saw a statistic the other, uh, not too long ago, that insinuated that um, only um, like five or six percent of people in the lower class actually graduate with a college degree. Um, I would want to verify that some more, but that really was eye-opening. Forty-five percent own their own homes in, a, in the least desirable neighborhoods, and the lower classes uh, are often found in inner cities since we're talking about urban sociology, and also in rural rural areas in the United States, like in West Virginia, like where we live. 
uh, and we're going to call that the end of this part.